of the mom's trial, although we have beginners, mom's trial compared prenatal to postnatal surgery uh, in a randomized fashion and became the gold standard in 2011. So what improved when you uh, operated a baby before birth and after birth was the 50% reduction in shunt rate, which is CSF deviation, tech, one of the techniques, and they doubled the ability of these babies to independent ambulate. So this was a major uh, achievement in our field, but it was open fetal surgery. And I will enter a small detail here uh, about how this surgery is done by the neurosurgeons, because this one of the first things that I had to change when I, I had in my mind that I could do it fetoscopically. So you have a, a cyst lesion here and you dissect the placard, which is the, the medulla. The placard goes down to, to the spinal canal and the neurosurgeon closes the dura mater, the muscle and the skin. So are three layers and we will concentrate on the dura mater effect of this suture here which I believe it was very different from the technique we developed. And I think it's key for us to understand how things were different. So you see the prof was here in 1998. Uh, few nights that I didn't sleep because I didn't know if he was going to get in the, on the plane or not. But anyway, he came, he supported me. We did, we done the first fetoscopy in Brazil uh, on that year. and. Um, I started trying to develop a simple technique to be able to do the repair. So I went into, everything was written in the literature in animal models to decide which technique would be better for the suturing, a patch, not a patch, uh, a rotation of a flap, not a flap. And I ended up using a biocellulose product uh, that is not my product, it's available worldwide. And I started, as he said, with uh, uh, rabbits and then the sheep. And the main thing about this product uh, is that it, uh, it, it, it enables the fetus to produce a neodura mater without you having to put sutures on it. So here you can see the um, spinal cord damage to, to the anterior, anterior horn and I placed the biocellulose, the skin completely closed and the only thing I've done was suturing the skin. I never sutured the cellulose to anywhere, I never closed the dura mater but it was very clear for me and this was year 2000, 2007 that this layer of fibroblast that surrounds the biocellulose had the anatomical continuity with the dura mater and should be able to form a neo dura mater without any suturing. So uh, before going to humans, I had the, the opportunity to test uh, the neurosurgical approach in the animal model compared to the patch. So here you can see the dura mater being sutured, then muscle, then skin, and here, just the biocellulose, not suturing it anywhere, just closing the skin with a, 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 a single running suture. It needed to be as simple as possible. And this comparison also struck me a lot because here in the left side, you can see the damage, in my view, that is the suture to the dura mater um, uh, produces in the fetus. So. In the right panel, you can see the medulla is completely intact and the neodura mater has formed in all cases. Here, there is a disruption of the spinal cord. Uh, you don't have more this um, form, this formation, and the spinal cord is attached to the, to the underlying tissues, which is what's going to happen in cases when you suture the dura mater and that's why you have tethering of the cord when the baby grows. So in that point, I also uh, um, thought that not only the baby would produce the new dura mater, but we would avoid the tethering of the cord. Uh, so we went on with a pilot study that I had the 
opportunity to present in Nice 2014 uh, was like crushed by all American guys eh, that exist in Earth, but I kept going. Uh, at that stage, we were using three trockers and we removed the amniotic fluid and injected the CO2. Um, when we started, we used um, gas for anesthesia, but now after our case 33, we only use intravenous anesthesia, which is also going to prove better in the future. Uh, we then moved to four trockers. Uh, when the posterior placenta, you have the normal setting, but when you have an anterior placenta, where you have to deal with what you have. And I have to say that the past 10 cases or so, I went back to three trockers and we are using only uh, this one that I could not read, get rid of, but maybe I will. I've been challenged by Prof for a long time to do it. So I'm trying now. Um, so this was uh, the, 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 one of the first cases we are, um, Releasing the placard, so this is the dura mater that was uh, attached to the skin. This is the principle of the disease. We dissect the placard, so the placard is down in the canal, and only in the subcutaneous tissue, we open a little bit of space to be able to place the biocellulose. And the biocellulose not only cheap, but it adheres more or less to the, to the area. And then the same continuous running suture with a barbed suture was performed and then the skin was completely closed. Um, uh, and we carried on with this technique, learning each step of the way uh, until we now developed a different approach, more or less the same, but I'm going to show you what happened differently. And this is especially for Nicola. So this was our first case, our, our first human case um, see that there is club foot bilateral, bilateral, and the skin was just like the sheep. Um, this baby was born premature, and I'm not sure if you are used it to the Chiari um, uh, process in the spina bifida, but um, simplifying, you have a lack, uh, the, the, the CSF fluid is being lost in the spinal canal, so the cerebellum when it goes down to the spinal canal and compresses the third ventricle, creating a hydrocephaly, which is not a ventricular megaly, with a dried brain because CSF is leaking all the time. So when the cerebellum goes up after surgery, this system is still dilated, but it stops there. So in our first case, the um, fetal MRI preoperative showed the cerebellum down into the, uh, into the spinal canal. The um, brain, the dry brain, there's no CSF around the brain. You cannot see the fourth ventricle and you see the cerebellum is in that very weird uh, uh, format. Four weeks after surgery, cerebellum completely going up, fluid around the brain and the, the fourth ventricle appears, which proves there was a watertight uh, repair of the defect. Otherwise, the CSF fluid would kept leaking and the brain would continue to be dried. So many times people um, asked me, but that's not watertight. And I said, come on, it's all, it's, you can see that. Um, also, we used the anatomical level as it was used in the mom's trial to determine um, the inclusion criteria for surgery. So, uh, unfortunately, the anatomical level not always corresponds to the clinical level. So, once we gain uh, experience, we were striked about two babies having the absolute same anatomical level and completely different motor levels. So how is that possible? And how can we deal with this anatomical uh, concept that everyone has, but we are seeing it's not like that. Um, so we in Brazil, after a while, abandoned the anatomical level as an inclusion criteria uh, because um, 
you can determine motor level by ultrasound. And this was shown by Elena's Carrera group. And it's very easy uh, once you learn because a normal baby can move and do the, all the movements that you need to determine the motor level very fast. So usually not more than seven minutes of observation, you can see all movements. And by ultrasound, not only 3D, I'm only using 3D here because it's easier for, for people to compare. This is the same baby before surgery and after surgery. And you can see this baby cannot do the plantar flexion. So this baby has not S1 preserved, but has L5. And it's very clear to uh, see that these babies keep the same motor level after surgery. Uh, another modification uh, other than abandoning the anatomical level was the use of humidification. Humidification of the CO2 was key to change our results very rapidly. So from case 60, uh, 76 onwards, we started humidifying and our gestational age of birth increased in two, three weeks. Uh, one other modification occurred around that same time. Uh, the CHOP group, which invented the, the, the MOMS technique, is, was performing a myofascial flap that was a little bit different from the myofascial flaps that are ordinary. Uh, so they changed it and they call it a modified myofascial flap and they first published this myofascial flap in 2015. And what is different about this flap is that the bone is included when you produce the flap and also you rotate the flap so there is less tension to the spinal cord. Um, some people are using a myofascial flap which only closes the muscle and there is no rotation and that in my opinion, ends up like creating a, a, a further increase in the, in the medulla in that area. And I believe differences that we are seeing now may be due to that. So this is how the technique developed and that's what we are doing now. Uh, this is a haxkaisis. We are dissecting the placard and we are cleaning the skin uh, that was um, and we are performing this flap, which entitles a uh, dissection uh, one centimeter more or less parallel to the defect. So you can see here the placard and we are raising this flap and there's raising of the flap, I believe is very, very important. And um, there is a little bit of training to do it, but it's completely doable even when we are operating in such a nasty position where the baby is transverse to us. We still apply the biocellulose, but the biocellulose now, biocellulose now is covered by the myofascial flap. So this changes also our, out our outcomes dramatically, in my opinion. Because from the moment we started doing this myofascial flap, uh, you will see the myofascial flap um, hides completely the biocellulose so the the healing of the scar is much better and you see here now you have a very good chunk of meat to put your second skin in is usually the, the skin defects too large and we can use a second skin an artificial skin and then this prevents us to do the relaxing incisions they are being used by some of the groups operating using the laparotomy assisted approach. And I'm going to touch in that subject soon. But you can see that the, this artificial skin uh, closes even a very large defect without relaxing incisions. And this product uh, is when the baby is born, the epithelium, uh, epidermis is already formed. So you just cut the suture, the silicone part of the patch falls and the skin be, uh, uh, really, uh, can, becomes much more beautiful, the scars. So I'm going to show you 
something that I I rather have done before, but I also always wanted to prevent to present all my cases without excluding the bad ones. But uh, we only now know that we um, things improved, and now we have a number of cases enough to take out the 20 first cases, and you will see that all numbers will improve further on. So here is 20 first cases out. Um, we have almost 90% of complete reversal of the hindbrain herniation. We have, we are now down to 35% uh, of VP shunts uh, relating to the moms is a little bit less. And I'm going to show with all these modifications how our cases changed over time. So when we started uh, with, with humidification, gestational age of birth changed from 32 to 34 weeks. And the essence and, and the repair site went down to zero. And we have a reduced also the CSF deviation. We have a uh, striking 60% walking independently, uh, and we have 33% bladder catheterization. And after we started the myofascial flap, no more surgeries for tethering of the cord. And this, in the long term, will be very important to compare our results uh, within the groups. So um, this is how independently walk the babies are. This is the spina bifida baby, and all of those are spina bifida babies uh, walking independently. And um, even older babies, this baby is now is six years old, seven years old already, and doesn't get the tethering of the cord. And what's the issue of cord tethering? Cord tethering uh, turns a baby that was able to walk independently go back to a walker or to a wheelchair. Because once this, the, the medulla is stretched, it um, uh, uh, forces the nerves and damages further. And whatever the baby loses, it doesn't come back again. So uh, we are also being able to observe babies that we never believed would would be able to stand up because this is how this baby was born uh, the baby went to the wheelchair but now she's able to uh, walk with crutches um, and i started wondering why our babies are more work, walking independently more than any other the tech, uh, techniques in use and i believe it's First, because of the myofascial flap, and this is an ultrasound, high definition ultrasound of a spinal cord of one of the babies that we operated. And when I saw this image, I said, oh my God, we are doing microscopy now with ultrasound. And you can see the nerves here. It's absolutely incredible from my eyes to be able to see that when the baby is born, because there's no bone here, we can do ultrasound easily. Uh, so now uh, we have two techniques out. One that uses the myofascial flap only with muscle, doesn't have bone, and doesn't do any rotation with this flap that has bone, muscle, and the rotation. So I think the differences will keep on going. Uh, and I want now uh, to be able to compare our results with the mom's trial. And I'm going to say that uh, we have 20% more walking babies. We have more or less the same CSF, and definitely we have less uh, neurogenic bladder. Uh, I told you uh, we still have uh, tethering of the cord from the first cases, but now for a long time we have not had. So back to Athens, when we had the first meeting of the International Consortium, we have now another technique, which is the laparotomy-assisted fetoscopy. Um, 
that's being used by half of the groups in the consortium. And the elephant in the room came out last week, last weekend, yes, no, last week, where we were talking about, about reports separately, the laparotomy approach versus the safer technique approach. And the laparotomy assisted approach is very, very, um, uh, how can I say, uh, it's easy to relate to it because of just the gestational age of birth and the PPROM. So when you are looking for um, short-term outcomes, it's definitely superior to the safer technique. But the long-term outcome will prove very soon that our results are going to be much better. And not only because we don't do the relaxing incisions, to create more space to close the skin. And you can see this is not only a scar, it's a very nasty scar. And this has been published in the year 2000 that that would happen, but people don't read research that's 10 years or older. So they probably couldn't find this article. Uh, but what strikes me the most is that they are having 28% of tethering of the cord in the short-term outcome. Imagine in the long-term outcome. So I'm happy to say uh, that, I, that I had the best time of my life traveling around the world uh, and teaching this technique. It was not a sacrifice at all. I love doing this. These people came first to Brazil. I had the honor to train Marta and Prof. And we now have five countries, eight centers joining us. I forgot to put Poland here, but I'm going to do it in the next. And we have the, our first publication of these eight centers, um, showing more or less what I, I have showed you. We, like I told you, we have family meetings and we are able to test the neurodevelopmental scales. And it's amazing to show that 58% are normal in the global score, which means they are normal even in the motor aspect. And in the mental uh, aspect, 94% have normal mental development. So, Prof, if I could not prove to you that uh, spina bifida is a different disease now, um, I hope one day I will hear you say that. But for now, because of the pandemics and because of my will to teach, we started doing a phase one training online. And so more centers can learn and see uh, and see our approach here. We are transmitting our surgeries online. So please use my WhatsApp to contact me, anyone that wants at least to see how we do it and we'll be able to help you also. So this is in honor to Nicola. I'll be in Milan very soon. Thank you very much for the time. Denise, thank you for such a fantastic lecture. As I said, your passion, your generosity, and your persistence um, have shown through. Um, I think that the, the most important thing, as we have discussed last week, is to remain um, united uh, despite the fact that different people are using different philoscopic techniques so that they can continue to, to, to learn from each other and, and, and improve the methodologies really. Uh, but your results look extremely uh, encouraging on the long-term outcome. I don't know if you want to comment, Nicola. Uh, to say. Well, I, I also congratulate a lot with Denise uh, for all these fantastic data that are coming out with, as time goes by. It, it looks something similar like uh, to the to the obstructive uropathy thing the, the importance of long-term follow-up that in that <laughs> case was not probably done but here now we are putting a lot a lot of, of efforts now uh, uh, what do you think of the issue of learning curve especially with the modifications that have been introduced how long do you think a center should practice uh, or if you have an idea of, of caseload before you know starting to get the results that you showed with your last part of your series well from the neurodevelopmental thing all centers can do this technique the modification easily 
uh, it's not a big deal. Um, we have the experience of Yuval starting doing it. Um, uh, Roman Schmidt in Los Angeles uh, are, is doing it. Um, I'm not sure if I had gone to mentor. I've, I've gone to mentor. No, Roman started doing by, his, by himself. And that's why I prepared these slides comparing the two myofascial flaps. So our group can change tomorrow. But the learning curve in terms of uh, short-term outcomes, which is gestational age of uh, delivery, um, you already start at the 32, uh, the 33 to 34 weeks um, mean. Uh, Roman now, which is from Los Angeles, is in his case 33. So he's going very fast. And he's already in the 34 weeks, almost 35. And we are working to see if we can find a high uh, a group that we can modify more the technique to be able to prolong pregnancy. But I honestly, I don't think we are going to go more than 35 weeks uh, with this technique. Uh, but I think it's if it was gone for TTTS and, and, and fetal tracheal occlusion, uh, why is not going to be good for spina bifida? Since 34 weeks with steroids, these babies only need to learn how to, to swallow and then they go home. They don't are not intubated, don't have hemorrhage. They go very well, even at 34 weeks. On the learning curve, uh, Denise, I, I just want to tell the audience before they get excited and they start doing something in some village in Greece, um, that the most important element, I think, is the multidisciplinary approach, isn't it? You need mm -hmm. anesthetists that know how to deal with a pregnant uh, woman uh, and how to anesthetize it properly. Uh, you need uh, somebody that is very, very good as a sort of an endoscopic type of surgeon, somebody that knows how to, to do laparoscopy, actually. Mm -hmm. You cannot take somebody from nowhere and, and, and implant them there to, to do those things. Um, so the learning curve of how to cut and how to stitch is... Zero, be, because you have to do it yeah, on the yeah, on the animal yeah. model prof before. Yeah, yeah, but you did them on the animal models, but also Martha, in my, in, in my case, yes, because she was the wife of, of George Pandis and because George, George Pandis was a brilliant endoscopic surgeon, she was a great endoscopic surgeon. So uh, she had to do a bit of training with you on some chicken or whatever, and then, but she already knew how to cut. But the most important thing is to have the whole team together, really. Um, and, and the same must have been true with you, Nicole. I mean, you, you have several people that must yeah. be coming from a background. You, you need to have an obstetric anesthetist, isn't it? You, you need to have an endoscopic surgeon. You need to have somebody that is very good with uh, with their hands, a uh, laparoscopic surgeon, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's a team work. This is one of the few procedures in fetal intervention where the, the theme really, really is important and yeah. nobody has to do to be, you know, jealous of what the others do. For example, in our case, uh, the pediatric surgeon does the repair with the dissection because he's used to do it more, much more frequently than us on the neonates with thor thoracoscopy. So his so learning care was several decades yes. of yeah. surgery. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The problem, Prof, is that um, each center will develop differently. And in among these uh, eight centers, sometimes it's the neurosurgeon doing the dissection, sometimes it's the pediatric surgeon, sometimes it's the, the, the gynecologist that is used to, to do oncology and laparoscopy. So one of the things that I've done in all centers that I trained was to see who wanted to do what and who was better to do that stage of the surgery? Because someone can enter with the trockers and leave to the other person to do it. And you can work both people, both two hands, four hands, uh, and it's up to each center to decide. And usually I give some hints because now I have the experience of doing this in many places. And I know more or less, I can see the people doing it. And I say, do it, do it, oh, like this. And you train with a chicken, really. But, of course, uh, the 
someone that has laparoscopy in the in a in the past is the best person to do it. Uh, it I doesn't need to be. I wanted to remind the audience before they start killing chicken that yeah. is not really with the chicken; is the breast of the chicken oh. after they die. Yes. So, yeah, <laughs> the one that oh, we cool. eat. <laughs> <laughs> Denise, your lecture was fantastic. Nicola, it was great to have seen you. Thank I you. think that uh, for me it was a great pleasure because so many of, of you have been with me at one stage or another of your career. So it, it was great. Um, I want to now thank on behalf of the speakers now, Sophia and George, for what they have uh, achieved. It would be nice to see Sophia and George say a few words. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, dear uh, Kipros, actually it was a, a fantastic uh, afternoon. I think it was uh, a celebration of uh, fetal medicine. And I can say that as a reproductive endocrinologist, uh, it was, uh, I, I enjoyed it so much. And uh, I have to give you some uh, statistics. We had more than 1,000 participants from all over the world, uh, from, uh, from Cyprus to Panama and uh, the rest of the globe. And we have more than 6,000 views. So actually on Monday, we will ask you if you allow us to uh, get, have uh, this uh, exciting uh, meeting online so they can uh, see it uh, on demand. Because we have so many, many uh, mm -hmm. comments. And uh, I have to say that I am uh, very proud because our fetal maternal unit is called uh, Kipros Nicolaidis. And uh, two years ago, I promised you that uh, we will implement the screening for preeclampsia. So even if it took me some time, now I can tell you that we are ready to do it. So I'm really, really uh, glad that we had this exciting uh, uh, course. And I would like to congratulate uh, George Papariano for putting it together because he is the course coordinator. So I'll give uh, the floor to you all because you contributed to this fascinating uh, uh, afternoon and this very exciting course. Yeah. Uh, thank, you, th thank, you, thank you, Professor. Yes, for, from my side, to thank uh, Petia and Denise for their fantastic uh, lectures. In, in general, this course was amazing. And uh, I'm very pleased. We had participants from other countries. This is because of the high level of the speakers and that the fact that they are well known. Thank you so much all for being with us and uh, all the attendees for, for attending. Uh, thank you, Prof, for hosting as well. And uh, I wish you the best, all the best. But uh, next year... And I hope that yeah, next year yes. you have to take I us hope to Plata. I you with me. To do some dancing. <laughs> this, this, is, this is guaranteed. This is Tell guaranteed. Me, uh, Denise and uh, Sofia will be competing for and your body. This is a promise. Next year will be Denise as well. I think she's huge a lot. I love dancing. I love dancing. Very good. This is, this is, this is a promise. <laughs> Thank you. So next year well. in Athens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for everything. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.